Hi everyone, hope you're well. Let's start with doing some meditation. I'll give a bit of instruction, but mostly it'll be quiet. Um, we'll sit for half an hour, okay? Let's see how that goes. So take a posture that you can hold fairly still and comfortably for the half hour. <clears throat> Begin by listening, listen to sound, and let your listening be receptive. So let the sounds come to you. And notice the silence of awareness. Feel your body breathing. Let your feelings be, be receptive to the feelings, breath. And notice the silence of awareness. Listen to sound. Feel the body. Perceive sound as in awareness. Perceive body feelings as in awareness. Silent witness, stillness of being, non-becoming, non-resistance, presence, awareness, it's like this. So if you can, or you like, just to sustain the silent awareness with the way things are, that's sufficient. But if you like something to pay attention to, then breath, of course. Most important thing is not the breath, it's the silent knowing, the silent awareness. So with an in-breath, silent knowing, out-breath, silent knowing, knowing an in-breath, knowing an out-breath. And if your mind is, is very active with a lot of thinking, Just keep remembering sound. Listen to sound. First establish awareness. And then use the breath. Silent knowing for an in-breath. Silent knowing for an out-breath. And with the thinking mind, just be very, very patient. Just return to some simple principle like this. Don't get rid of thought. Thought's natural. And just be peaceful with whatever situation, whatever you're experiencing now. So peaceful coexistence with the way things are. Okay, just a simple instruction. Let's sit quietly for the half hour.
Good evening, Long Paul. Hi, Bita. So now request for the down the top, Long Paul. Brahma Charova Bipati Sahampati Tata Jayama Biwara Naya Chata Santi Dasa Tata Arajata Jatika Bese Tadana Anukampi Mampacha, the Brahma Sahampati, Lord of the world, the palms joined in reverence, requested a favor. Beings are here with but little dust in their eyes. Pray, teach the Dharma out of compassion for them. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Uttang dhammang sankhang sam. Hello everyone. Hope you're doing well. Uh, news from the monastery, it's super quiet right now, there are very few guests, uh, the builders have even stopped for a few days, and we have what we call a quiet week where we don't do any projects, so it's very nice, very nice indeed, and I'm in good form, I just, uh, last month I did a trip with William and Karina from Singapore and Michael and Zito from KL and we drove from Santa Citta Rama in Italy near Rome across to Sumeda Rama in Portugal which was 2500 miles which is great. It was actually feasting on architecture, landscape and too many cappuccinos I think. It was great fun. And what else? And uh, oh, yesterday was Lopo Semedo's 89th birthday, and I had a, I had the pleasure of being with him for a couple of weeks in in Italy. So that was really grand. And and the next year, his 90th birthday, we'll have uh, Ajahn Amaro is organizing a big gathering at Amaravati to pay respect and honor his 90th birthday, all being well. So that's the news from here. Um, yeah, my own life is very, very sweet right now, mostly because the monks here and the samaneras and the lay stewards and lay friends do so much work that I can just sort of float in and out like an old man should, I suppose. <laughs> but it's really great. They're just such lovely people. So talking with Lompo Semedo, <clears throat> and, you know, we always uh, go back to the good old days or talk about this or that. But one of the things that he reminded me of was in his first month, as a, or his first year, three months, I think, as a summoner, because he ordained as a summoner no kai, and he went to train with Ajahn Chah a year later. But in that, in the first few months, and you probably heard his stories when he talks about it, he had a tremendous upwelling of all, ma all manner of resentments and angers and just a whole, just one day after another, one hour after another, just a lot of garbage coming out of him, repressed things that he hadn't really noticed. And this often happens when you begin meditation. Uh, just there's no, when the mind isn't distracted, these things can come out. It happens sometimes on the start of a 10-day retreat. People have been too busy to process things and then things start to come up. I certainly had that in my first years of meditation. A lot of things coming up. Um, but then like when Lompo Sumedho just 
endured that really for a long, long time. For like, I think he said three months. Maybe it was one month, but I think he said maybe one month. But anyway, it was quite, uh, quite hectic, <laughs> to say the least. And his mind all of a sudden went silent. And he was in total, absolute bliss. And I, you know, I don't know. Maybe he thought he was enlightened, or whatever. But it was very neat. And uh, then he had to go down to the town, and then it all fell apart. And the old habits came up again. So even though we process sometimes things, uh, unfortunately, there's a kind of momentum of habitual reaction to circumstances that we need to both endure, but also not indulge in. And so there is a place for like purification things coming up, just coming into the mind. Um, but there is a there is a possibility of being too passive and just sort of wallowing in in moods. And so what would be the difference? Well, I think I was contemplating that today. This that for me the difference would be the the understanding of thought and. I think one of the great discoveries of a contemplative or a meditator is that you are not your thoughts. I mean, that's such a great discovery, isn't it? Until you, until you see that, you're just lost in thinking, worries and fears and resentments. I mean, that's a pretty, not a very good way to be. Uh, and then suddenly you realize, oh, that thought is an object. Probably a big, big step in, in human sanity, isn't it? Um, that, and we and we have this capacity to reflect. I can not only, um, like I can I can look at the color green, so I can perceive color, and then I can maybe see that I like the green color. It's a very beautiful color, and I really like it. I can perceive that I like. I can perceive that I dislike. I can notice. I can be aware that I like and I dislike. I can feel uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm weaving a rug right now. And uh, it, some of it is quite, like a lot of craft, it's quite boring. It's not like your creative juices are just going all over the place and you're excited. No, no, uh, creating something is just a lot of hard work, actually. And so, so it can be very boring. Uh, but I can notice, I can notice boredom is a mental object. Or it can be quite interesting designing something, changing the color, figuring out the, the pattern. But interest is something I can notice in as, as an object too. I can not only can I be interested, but I can notice a mind which is interested. Not only can I be bored, but I can notice a mind which is bored or frustrated or whatever. And this capacity of reflection makes enlightenment possible. If we didn't have that, we'd just be in, in, in the soup all the time, reacting. And one of the things that we try to train in as contemplatives is the observation of thought as an object, rather than be caught in the thinking. This is very difficult, very difficult to do, because when you, when you, you start to reflect and have some sense of witnessing and awareness, you see how, how compulsive some of our habitual, some of the thoughts are. They're not bad, they don't be bad, but just the mind likes to constantly, um, or attention goes into those spaces of our thinking, not really spaces, objects. So one of the, one of the venerable ways of, of uh, considering thought, one is to, to again, contemplate thought and, and notice that thoughts are driven by moods, are driven by some kind of background. So it might be planning, it might be um, excitement about the future, usually it's about the past or the future, it might be some resentment, but there is some kind of underlying uh, energy there. And that's important to notice too, isn't it? So just to, like in, in going, considering what reflection is, um, maybe, can you switch the lights on? 
So then we might need some, uh, excuse me, just switch some lights on. Um, so thinking, reflecting. Um, so not only can I notice that I'm like worrying, that I'm thinking about tomorrow, or whatever, but I can get behind the thinking and say, well, there's actually a, a pattern to this thinking. It's worry, or it's, um, it's feeling resentful or feeling excited and so on. So we're, we're all the time as contemplatives developing this capacity for reflection. Obviously, I think that's self-evident and getting better and better. At it. Now, when you, when we um, then become a bit more adept, let's say we've done some of the purification work and, and the heaviness of our, of our karma has been somewhat alleviated, at least I think that's the experience for most people I know, that there's still the, the, the habitual thinking and, and, and also sometimes we have triggers which we're not aware of and something gets triggered and we get very upset and then thinking becomes even more rapid, more rapid and more rapid. Um, so one of the, the great techniques which you've all, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, coming from India and China and the Far Eastern tradition, Eastern traditions is the, um, not to just kind of notice that you're thinking, but be proactive and ask yourself who is thinking to actually go to the very sense of a think curve. And that's, it's commonly taught, but it is incredibly interesting um, reflection to, to participate, or to, to take up and consider and do uh, an experiment with. And if any of you have done that, I think we've all tried it. So you have to, first of all, notice that you think, <laughs> it seems obvious, but you know, all, many of us can just, walk walk through a woodland and be thinking all the time kind of know we're thinking but or then we can just sort of look at something try to get rid of thought uh, yeah okay so we, we can we can try to focus on something and get rid of thought works doesn't work at least it's something but there is a you know sense of being proactive not just being caught in thinking uh, and because thinking is natural it's not wrong it's not bad but if our, if our attention is always, as I say, I constantly use this language, if our attention is preoccupied with thought, then we can never notice the beautiful silence of the background. We can never notice the deep silence of the ble deep blue sea. We're always very superficial on our personalities and thinking patterns. So actually taking the time in meditation to learn this very uh, simple, um, and a very direct method of who's the thinker. And when you do that, do that right now if you want, who's the thinker? You'll find silence. It's, it's a paradox. There's always this blah, 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 blah going on. What am I gonna do? What's going to happen? Uh, have I got enough money for retirement? Oh gosh, I don't know. Why did they do that? Oh, I'm gonna buy this, I'm gonna buy that. Oh, I should have done this. Could have done that, but they did that to me, blah, 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 blah. Who's the thinker? Now, that sense of self seems very real, doesn't it? Very solid kind of thing. It, this is definitely real. I really hate that person. I really resent them, blah, 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 blah. Well, I shouldn't be resentful. I shouldn't be like that. I should be a good Buddhist, da, 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 da. So it seems it look like a really solid thing called me. And yet, when you, when you just say, who's thinking? You won't find anything. There's still consciousness. It's not that you, you become you know, some kind of zombie experience. There's still consciousness. There's still sense data. S stuff is happening, as it were. But the consciousness is no longer furnished with a sense of self. It's empty of a sense of self. Huh? And that's what we sometimes refer to as empty. It's not empty. Of, that's some kind of nothingness, but empty of that sense of self. That's very, very, it's very, I mean, it's not difficult. Do it any time, just like you're worrying, say, who's worrying? Now, this will not be effective if you try to find yourself. <laughs> it's, uh, you go crazy then. Who am I? Where? Who said that? I said that. Who said that? And then you just go in circles. So it's not, it's not that you're going to find anything, because quite often that's the difficulty with a question. You want an answer. The answer is silence. And the answer is going to the question. Who's thinking? 
Now that silence is, is the silence of no thought, the silence of no self, we say, at one side, but yet there is consciousness. And there is stillness, and there is awareness, and there's sense data going on. And that's what you want to explore as a contemplative. You know, I, I think I think we think too much. <laughs> you know, so so oftentimes our our uh, attention is taken by analyzing, self-analyzing. Why is this problem like that? And although that's a necessary part of life, um, some slice of our uh, bandwidth and our time, I think, should be dedicated to no thought, to the silence of the mind, to the emptiness of the mind. Now, you may think that's kind of difficult to do, but in a split second, it's not that difficult. If if you just try it, just give it a go. So I suggest, in, like in your meditation, sometimes we meditate and we really try to get focused and hold an object. Okay, we do that. Sometimes we, we, we choose no object. But this is a kind of direct looking at uh, at the mind. This, when we talk about the mind knowing the mind, this is the way, one of the ways it's done. Now, if you, if you pick that up as a kind of curiosity, rather than just some other technique to get rid of thinking, remember that meditation in Buddhism should be in line with non-desire, non-becoming, and non-resistance. If you're trying to get rid of something by thinking, who, who's thinking to get rid of thought? That will be coming from the wrong place. Uh, if you're just trying to become empty or something like that, that will be a sense of me doing something to become something. But this is a very time, you know, the idea of, of Buddhist liberation is a timeless possibility in the back of consciousness, shall we say, or consciousness itself, whatever, in that silence. And, and, and investigating in that silence is, is important. So if we're trying to get silence by getting rid of thought, which we often do, I've certainly done it too many decades, <laughs> That that won't work. It'll seem like you're you're you're, you're doing it right. So the, the the reflective capacity has to be applied to why am I even meditating? How do I how do I apply my attention? What what is the attitude I'm bringing to this thing? What 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 am I what am I doing actually? Where's my mind coming from? Where am I? Am I trying to get something? Am I trying to get rid of something? Or am I just trying to absorb into some object? To, to, to pacify and get rid of everything. And those are the three ways of tanha, which we, we see in the Four Noble Truths. And that's the reflective capacity. So when we sit down, like these little meditations that that I lead for 30 seconds or so, very short, but I, I mean, the suggestion is, is quite profound in the sense, receptive awareness is not awareness with desire. Receptive listening is not listening to get a sound. Right? It's not to get an experience called sound, it's to establish the silence of knowing sound. And that's terribly important, terribly important in, in the way we approach our meditation. And that has to be remembered every time you meditate. Every time you meditate. One has to make uh, a firm decision to meditate. That's another one. Because quite often if we're, if we're old timers, we kind of sit down and just get into the posture and the mind wanders. So there has to be a kind of determination of presence. Determination of presence in this kind of idea. So when I when I suggest to you listen to sound, I really listen and notice the silence of the mind. Really listen and notice the silence of the mind. Know your breath. There was a silence of the mind. So it's always going back to the silence of awareness, to the silence of consciousness or whatever way you want to say. So if you if you kind of pick up something that you're interested in, like who's thinking, then you start to notice the silence between thoughts, after thoughts. So when you when you, you notice your thinking is going on, rather than trying to get rid of thinking, just ask yourself, who's thinking? But again, be careful, don't do it to get rid of thoughts. Quite often, that's what people do. Okay, the Bhante said, who's thinking? Oh, yeah, I can get rid of thought. And it's not, you know, it's like deeper in you. It's not like a, it's almost like a reaction. Oh, stop thought, stop thinking. 
No, this is a this is a very open inquiry. So you know the mood of the mind, say that the mood of the mind is fantasizing about tomorrow or um, shopping or worrying or whatever it is. When you actually actually notice that, oh worry, this is worry. That's very helpful. Then you're really awakening. Worry feels this way. And then then as worry starts to produce thinking, who's thinking? You're not trying to get rid of the worry, you're not trying to get rid of thinking, but you're going to the silent background of knowing. Now that might only be a split second. And then five minutes of the meditation goes by, and then you hear someone's voice outside, and oh, it's like this, back to the present moment. Present moment's always there, it's never gone. <laughs> Yeah, you can do that one too. And then, who's thinking? And then maybe that's the silence is noticed for like two seconds, three seconds, the space between thought. And you begin to savor that silence. It's like this. You hold attention on that. Not in any, any kind of coercive way. Just, oh, silence is like this. And of course, obviously, when when the silent space of consciousness is, is more and more felt, known, appreciated, uh, whatever, uh, then the arising of emotions and thoughts and the reactive conditioning of the thinking processes, that's obviously, that's noticed more and more. And as it's noticed more and more, it can, it can, there's more and more choice to pick it up, think through those in that direction, or who's thinking? And it has a cumulative effect, who's thinking? The silence is always there. It's not something you're creating. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not anyone's ownership. It's just there. It's just the nature, the nature of, of consciousness is silent. And so what happens when you start to appreciate that, you also can get into tune, like we, in, into tune, <laughs> get in tune with things like, like we were talking this morning about some of the insights on, 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 on chronic pain and, and the, the mental constituents of chronic pain, how the, the reactions, uh, we, we're talking about like chronic Lyme's disease or fatigue syndrome or, or chronic Lyme's or things like that, where there is a mental component that just has a kind of habit of creating the pain. Pain is real, but actually investigating that habit, that's quite difficult, but it's very, very real. So there's some, some now, I'm not too clear on this. I was talking with someone who is more clear on this, but there is some symptom of, of whatever associated with the chronic illness, and then the mind picks that up inadvertently. And then there's the feeling of the illness. And the feeling is very real. It's not unreal. So the, the, the methodology that we were talking about is to really, really be very attentive to the first arising of some manner of habitual negativity around the, 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 chronic, the chronic illness. Again, I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but you could see that if you, if you had a, a, a facility for noticing silence, if you really began to explore that, you, you have to take time. You know, it's, it's, um, you have to make time just to, you know, fill the mind all the time, busy all the time, but that's not, you know, you have to give that up sometimes. So, but I think we're kind of serious practitioners. We can, we can do this. Well, if you if you get a, a, a you can see obviously if you get a sense of silence, then when some physical expression of chronic illness comes up, you can see what, what's the mind doing there. What's it holding? What's it creating? What's it adding to it? And then you can let go of that and go back to the silence and witnessing. What the chronic pain might feel like, and the suggestion is from what I've—I don't know if I'm misrepresenting it. Someone can write to me if I am, but but the idea is that you you know there's ways of deep understanding of of what the mind is doing if if we're attentive, and this is why we talk about samadhi uh, and and meditation and right effort. So so the awakened mind is a kind of refreshed silent. Base unfurnished by eye making and mind making, empty of eye making and mind making, and that's the kind of platform where we learn a lot. Where we, we need that kind of platform. 
And so if if there are, you know, whether it's chronic mental habits or, or I mean, chronic, I mean, habitual, we all have them, don't we? Cynicism or, or doom scroll, like I was, we were joking about doom scrolling, where we doom scroll our own minds, <laughs> just kind of going through, or, or, or whatever, you know, positive, really excited about something, but to actually just know how the mind keeps reacting, reacting, and not to be preoccupied with that, to, to say, well, this is the movement of consciousness, this is a movement of sense experience, this is natural, nothing right or wrong, but we'll never find our liberation in that. We might find interest, so we'll never find liberation in weaving rugs, but it is interesting, it is fun sometimes, sometimes it's boring, but that's just the movement of doing, that's just the movement of, of a lifestyle. But really what, what's most important to me, and I think to all of us, is, is the point of the spiritual life, and the point of the spiritual life, I would say, is, 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 no, is, is honored as we touch the silence of the mind, as we touch the stillness of being. Man's curiosity searches past and future, and clings to that dimension, but the intersection of the timeless and time is the occupation of a saint. You know that old T.S. Eliot poem? The intersection of the timeless with time. Timeless with time. Huh? Amata Dhamma. What is time? Well, time is me. I shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have done that. Oh, it was a horrible meeting yesterday. I really blew it yesterday. Or, oh, that was fantastic. It was really good. Past, future, when, when, I don't know, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, it's not going to be good, it's going to be bad. Past and future, past and future, self-making, I-making, going on all the time. The intersection of the timeless is time, is, it's like this. Who's thinking? It's a very calm, presenting, <laughs> yeah, that's not a very good word, uh, making present what's going on, knowing the present moment. And obviously this has to be done a lot, because... The power of our thinking minds, the power of thinking habits, it is very, very strong. Very, very strong. When you, when you touch a kind of unfurnished space, when you notice the unfurnished space of silence and, and the mind isn't cluttering up all that space with the furniture of anxiety or the furniture of resentment or whatever, how Baroque it can get. A bit too much in architecture recently. <laughs> That's where my mind is going. But when when you when you when you touch the silence of the mind, then you can you can put beautiful things into it. May all beings be free from suffering. What a beautiful piece of art that is, huh? May all beings be free from suffering. Lovely, lovely. You furn you can furnish consciousness with beautiful things. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from pain. Then these, then these words take a huge significance because now they're being placed in a very receptive vehicle. And, and the whole, your whole being vibrates with that. It loves it, doesn't it? If you say to yourself, may you be free from worry. And much nicer than worry. <laughs> now, if you just try to get rid of worry, like if you're worrying, you say, maybe free from worry, maybe free from worry, maybe that's, you're probably still worrying. It's probably the same thing going on. It's just thinking. But if you just settle down calmly and say, oh, who's worrying? You've got, to give yourself, you've got to give yourself space to do it. You have to notice that this is a mood. This isn't ultimate reality. Uh, this is a mood, a sense of self and time being created through habit, through conditioning, through karma. Okay. And then who's thinking? And you touch that silence, and then the mind, well, yeah, yeah, but that's very well for you to say, well, 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 yeah, yeah, but who's thinking? I, am, I need to worry about who's thinking. <laughs> you have to be very persistent, very persistent. Like training a dog, maybe, I'm not sure. I'll have to tell that story, yeah. But this is what we mean by training. Uh, you know, like you, you're, you're awakening the mind, you get that, you, you, you get understand how to use the reflective mind, you get that. And then you start to figure out, okay, where, where does my attention get preoccupied and where does it lose space? Where is, you know, what's this kind of furniture that keeps <laughs> crowding in on my room? Why can't I see the other end side of the wall? What's going on here? 
And that this is a very powerful, powerful method. Who's thinking? And then you touch the silence. You don't have to get anything. Now, when you touch silence, of course, you think, well, well, now what? <laughs> now do I do? That's desire. Desire wants to do something again. It, no, nothing to do. It's just the silence. Taste the silence. So you might give that a go. It becomes very, very useful when, when you get upset. You know, when something goes wonky and your mind just starts to really churn up a lot of self-thinking. And that's a fabulous go-to technique. Lock yourself in your room or the washroom if you're at work. And, and as the mind just starts to create all kinds of thinking problems, yeah, yeah, but who's thinking? Yeah, but I need to, yeah, sure, but, but who's thinking? But you can't, you can't, yeah, yeah, but who's thinking? And you're really, very diligent, very diligent. But you're not trying to get rid of thought, but you're dissolving, 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 dissolving the habit all the time. Who's thinking? Now, if you've never done that, and you've never practiced that, then you don't have the kind of experience of it. All of, a, lot of, a lot of these things, metta bhavana or these kinds of, you know, you know, straight looking, they require a bit of playing around with. And, but they become really powerful uh, allies and, 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 and tools in your, in your daily life. They're not just for the meditation cushion, because they are very applicable to the complexities of life too. Very, very, very applicable. But they need to be learned in more silent and tranquil situations. It's very, very helpful. So let me just leave you with two stories, good stories. One is from the monastery. One is that uh, Venerable Amr Sir, who many of you know, much loved, you know, he's had a broken ankle for three and a half years now, and he's been unable to get an operation, partially through COVID, but also it's a very complex break inside the joint. And so finally, he has his operation on the 4th of August. So as we say, pray for him, send metta. And I'm quite anxious about that operation and, and but quite excited in some kind of a weird way. That's been so, so very, very long. And then the other great story is we have been gifted a dog. And we have one of our... <laughs> One of our members, a, one of the great elderly stewards of the <laughs> Nirasso, has taken on the duty of being the dog owner. And so the dog is not just a little lap dog. It is a Burmese mountain dog, which is the size of a small pony, I think. It's fully grown. It's five months old, correct? Five months old, and its name is Simon. So Simon is coming on the second, the second with his mom, with his mom. And um, then mom will be here for two days, one day, two days. And then mom will leave and Simon will have to deal with separation anxiety. And uh, Irasso and Michelle and everyone else were given so many treats and TLC they will never want to leave. We've never, you know, we don't usually, monasteries have cats quite often, or sometimes stray dogs, but like a, a pedigree dog that's been gifted, I mean, that's the first that I've, that I've seen, maybe it exists. But I'm sure the, the, uh, the fluffy fellow will give us lots of love, and um, I think people are already putting in bookings to, to get access to the dog, but it did come two weeks ago, 10 days ago, with brother, mother, and father? Uh, sister, mother, and brother. Sister, mother, and brother. So we had four of these great fluffy things jumping around. We all loved it. <laughs> it was great fun. So that's, that's the stories of the monastery, and I'll leave that for your reflection. Andamayam Dhammagataya Sadhu Karanda Dhamma Se Sadhu 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 Anumodami Any questions for anyone or advice on dog rearing?
So we have uh, Malika with her hands up. So anyone Please. who wishes to ask a question, you could click on the raise hand button and we'll uh, invite you to unmute. So uh, Hi, Malika. Uh, unmute yourself. Uh, unmute yourself, Malika. Try Can again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Ajahn, thank you. I just, my friend Sandhya came to visit you and it was, she sent lots of photos. Okay. <laughs> and my question is, Ajahn, can you, can a consciousness be devoid of self? Can consciousness well, it is. Because, you know, in, there is no self in, in, the, in the way of that there is no kind of fixed object. Um, because the the sense of a self exists, but that's that's a construct contingent on experience, conditioning, all kinds of things. But when you try to find uh, this sense of a me, what you'll find is silence. So consciousness is there, but you won't find a center or a person or a soul or an individual. There is consciousness, and you'll see. Consciousness has no kind of center. It has no boundary. It just is, is the kind of knowing, the pure knowing. So it's not that consciousness can, uh, can exist without a self. It does not have a self in, in what we, the way we talk. Now in Hinduism, you know, this is very, very tricky because in Hinduism or in Advaita Vedanta, they have a different kind of language around this. So in Advaita Vedanta, they'll have a big S self and a small S self. Now, if I'm correct, the big S self is what we call the unconditioned, the Amata Dhamma uh, in Advaita Vedanta, and the small S is what we call um, personality view or whatever. So uh, you have to make sure you don't get these different schools of language mixed up. But in Theravada Buddhism, what we mean by... Um, Anatta is that in the sense experience, in thoughts, in emotions, in sight, sounds, and smells that come and go, come and go, you won't find a, a fixed person. You just find the change of experience. So Buddhism doesn't say that there is no self. It doesn't say that. It says that in that which arises and ceases, you won't find any fixed entity. That's the phrasing from Theravada Buddhism. So it doesn't say there's nothing. But it, what it does say is there's the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unformed. The unformed, the uncreated, Amata Dhamma or Akalika Dhamma, right? And, and that we can realize by letting go of time, letting go of becoming or our, all our references to time. I was in the past, I will be in the future. Letting go of all that and coming with, with, with attentive uh, presence to the way things are, to the silence of the way things are. And that is why we, we constantly sing abandon tanha, because tanha is always about either being absorbed in some experience or becoming or getting rid of bhava and vibhava. And that preoccupation prevents this, this understanding of, of the timelessness of the amata dhamma. Is that? Can, so can we train our mind uh, for that, uh, not to have that self? Ask, ask that only? question. Ask that question. Who is Malika? You're right? And, and when you ask that question, don't try to find yourself as a, as a Sri Lankan or as a woman or as a young person. You know, don't try to find a, you won't find any entity. What you'll find is silence. Who is Malika? And, and hold the silence, trust in the silence, that's, that's the pathway. But you'll notice that you touch the silence and your mind will bring up a doubt. You say, well, is that right? Am I doing it right? Then you're caught in an object again, thinking. Or it's boring. Actually, peace is very boring to tanha. So it gets boring. You think, oh, I think I'll go have a bit of ice cream or something <laughs> or something like that. Peace is boring to Tanha. It really is. So, so then, I, even though silence is noticed, then the desire mind comes up to do something, and you find yourself thinking, planning, organizing. Then go back and say, "Who's thinking? 
it's a rigorous, it requires quite a rigorous uh, attentiveness moment by moment, but it's not rigorous in the sense that it's harsh, it's just rigorous in the sense of awakening and diligence, the kind of diligence that you need. So try that. It's, just just yeah. give it's that a go. Possible, and see what yeah. It's not possible to do normal times only through meditation. Only no, meditation. once you get good at it, you're doing it all the time. You are it all the time, really. But um, yeah, it, you know, all these things are, are at some at some level they seem refined, but then at some level they seem very ordinary. So, you know, it, it quite depends um, on where you're at in your practice. But you've been practicing a long time. Your seal is very good. Don is very strong. So, you know, your mind isn't cluttered with too much uh, remorse or things like that. So try it, you know, try it out. And like, like you can do it at dinner, but you won't be very great conversationalist probably. <laughs> well, maybe you I will. Could say. Yeah, I could send an answer for uh, uh, Ajahn Vajiru's birthday. I did an answer for him and sent it for his birthday. When is his so birthday? Happy. Isn't he a Finish Yeah, oh, go. I was go just, on. I was just there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, Malika. Okay. All right. And who is next? Ch Chan, Chani, Danny, Chan. Chani. Johnny Chan. Please unmute yourself. Uh, Brother Chan, yeah. unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Longpo. Thank you, Bita. Uh, my, my question is this. Uh, I've many a times, many a times we were taught that to let uh, our aware, awareness be aware of itself, meaning the awareness is aware of awareness. So is that related to what we have been talking this morning? Exactly. Yeah. There's many ways of pointing to that, the mind knowing the mind, awareness knowing awareness. And this is a kind of direct um, suggestion for that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so how does it work? How does it work? In short, I mean, I, you I, do, I, it. I do it and see how it works. Just just like, do it for six months. Awareness, being aware of itself. Okay. Yeah, actually, actually I've been doing it, but I just want to know a bit more insight into it. Well, it should take you to silence. Mm -hmm. And then when you sustain the silence, um, then the sense of self falls away and the depth of the silence becomes more and more profound. Mm -hmm. And in the depths of the silence, you also find love. Mm -hmm. The Brahma Vihara is manifest through that as well. Mm -hmm. So it, what it takes is just a lot of trust and trusting in the silence rather than trusting in thought. Mm -hmm. So one of the, as I was saying earlier, one of the uh, hindrances to that is doubt. Am I getting anywhere? Is this working? Am I doing it right? So if that comes up, just say, who said that? And then, then you're back. You're back with that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bon chance. Lampo has a question, type question. Uh, from Joey in Bangkok, our friend Joey in Bangkok. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, we would like to clarify the name of the dog. Is it Silent or Simon? Simon. As in Simon and Garfunkel. Ah, okay. So, so uh, Joey's uh, question yes, is, yes. will Simon take any precepts? Example, will Simon eat afternoon? Yeah, no, we're going to shave his head, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's a dog, Joey. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, there you are. I got you. There's, there's Joey. <laughs> Joey, would you like to have a, a follow up question, Joey? <laughs> I think that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the floor? Anyone else? Yes, Gabriel. 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 I once asked you that. You have a good memory, Bunte. Uh, it is Gabriel. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
thank you so much for the the Dhamma talk because I've been caught up in a um, one of those chronic habits of worry, and um, and uh, it, it's involving a family member who's on a rather self destructive course and and being quite um, helpless in terms of um, redirecting him, um, and so. I've been giving a lot of thought to compassion, um, that um, ability to be with another suffering, but I keep getting drawn into it myself. And I just wonder if you could offer a few reflections on compassion so that there's a little more, um, you know, impartiality. I don't dare say the word equanimity, but you know, um, to be cooler, uh, but I'm getting drawn into that suffering and, and, uh, wanting to help a great deal, but knowing there's very little I can do until he's ready. Yeah. Those, those are such tragic things for families. They're really, really difficult to deal with, but maybe you could contemplate a way of thinking about empathy and compassion. Um, you know, if, if empathy is that we are in the suffering of that other person, that's to me different than compassion. Because if I am living the other person's suffering, I don't have the space to know, oh, that's, that's, that's really difficult. So that's one thing that i was just reading something yesterday actually on that it was an interesting thought around being in someone else's shoes is that it's such a good thing you know i i'm i'm with you in your suffering in that kind of visceral way whereas yeah you're really suffering may you be free from suffering for, for well one of the, the way i learned that lesson to some extent, but it was not as extreme as yours. And yours is a is a very, very difficult one. But with, and I've talked about this before, but when my mother, um, when I was taking care of her, uh, she, she had painkillers for osteoarthritis and they worked quite well, but sometimes when the weather was very damp and the barometric pressure was changing, then she'd have quite strong pain and then I would notice it. And then she would try to be quiet so that I wouldn't notice it. And then I would try to not notice it. <laughs> so we're doing this kind of dance of not noticing mom's suffering. And just kind of contemplating my own mind, I thought, I don't want her to suffer. Well, that's natural enough. Obviously, I don't want to suffer, but that wanting is something that is not in my power. What's in my power is to care for her and give her uh, support and so on. And that was in my power. But I, I couldn't take away the pain of a 95-year-old body. Although I could do medical things to some extent. And seeing that the compassion was not the desire to uh, get rid of her suffering and trying to get, not wanting her suffering was a form of craving. It's, it's, it's a very altruistic and benevolent and good form of grieving, but it still caused suffering and tension. So when I took responsibility for that, I said, well, mom, she has her karma. She's not asking me, you know, to take her karma. She's not, she's saying, well, I can deal with this. I'm okay. And when I saw, oh, it's, when I saw her in pain, it wasn't that, that bad, but it was still, you know, it wrenched the heart. And, and when I saw that, oh, I don't want this. But it's like this, you know, this pain is like this. So when I got a hold of the wanting, wanting it to be other than it is, but not being passive, doing what I could, when I got a hold of that, then I started to move to, toward the balance of equanimity and compassion. I saw, okay, yeah, it's the desire to have some or not be what they are that prevents the peaceful coexistence with compassion, the peaceful participation in compassion. So that's one thing you could look at then. You obviously don't want this person to keep going down the path the way they're going. So you have to look at the wanting. 
And then there's obviously there's still compassion. There's no lack of that. And and just kind of get a visceral sense of that. I, you know, when you when you visualize where the person is going, it's very painful. And then say, oh yeah, pain feels this way. Life's tra this is tragic. Tragic feels this way. Family tragedy, it feels this. You keep coming back to suchness and then watch the desire. I don't want it this way. Yeah. Yeah, good, but here it is. Which isn't any kind of passivity or 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 uh, uh, cold hearted acceptance, is it? There's still deep compassion. And that might make you cry, or, or you know, probably cried already. Uh, uh, but that's okay, isn't it? And and then you say, oh, compassion accepts the way things are. Compassion is not the desire to get rid of. Compassion might compel me then to do something, sure, and I act on it every way I can. But I think the mind, which is, yeah, life, life is that must be that must really hurt. You know, that's really painful. Maybe be free from suffering rather than trying to fix it. I, yeah. I like that compassion is accepting the way it is. Yeah. Not that I approve, no, I um, you know, or agree, but it's like this. And like Ajahn Sumedho says, it all belongs. And yes, it's his yes, karma. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. You know, I mean, yeah. it's easy enough in speaking with you but when I'm alone with this mind and it goes down the rabbit hole of worry, um, it, it just gets really challenging. And, and the you worry know. takes you away from compassion. Mm -hmm. Right? Because worry is not yeah. compassion. So try the, I don't know, try the, who, you know, who's thinking in a gentle way, just to kind of get, get through the, the kind of quagmire of thinking. Who's thinking? Mm -hmm. Who's thinking? You know, really gently. And then just see what happens within that. Because on one hand, you know, you, you see you see the worry mind, then you try to get rid of the worry mind, and it comes up again, and there's this constant battle in thought. So you really, you're always still in the same kind of playing field of one thought fighting another thought. But when you when you ask this question, who's thinking, you're kind of more like in the stadium. In the space of the stadium, you're not down on the playing field, two fight, two parties fighting each other out, and then it turns up again, and, and then again, if if it, if it sounds like an interesting thing to do, don't use it to get rid of thought, because very quickly, you know, this is the perversion of of desire. You you figure out a really good way to get to the silence of the mind, and then you try to use that to get rid of thought, and you're back in the same. It's tricky, but that might be yeah. interesting. Um, well, and, and I'm not sure whether verbally doing it. Sometimes uh, what you were teaching uh, some time ago last year, perhaps, about background foreground, yeah. I found that really effective. Okay. Uh, somehow it was more visual. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, but I get the idea. Yeah, there's so many ways to approach it. Once you still got to remember the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, bon chance. Thanks. Thank you, Gabriela. Any other questions? Um, right. I think DC wants you to know, Gabriela that you're not alone and we are in this together. Uh, know that uh, this Dharma platform, it's here as a global community to support one another. So may you find peace and uh, the resource and support. Any other last questions? Anyone? Okay. A question for you from Philae from Toronto. What does um, karma what, mean to you? What does karma mean to you, Lompo? The habit. <laughs> so it's just habit. Sorry. Okay. Well, Thank karma you. is, <laughs> I guess I should expand on <laughs> Couldn't get away with a short one. 
So kama means action and intentional action creates results, vipaka kama. But if you, if you look at how stream of consciousness works, you can see it's just patterns, habitual patterns of thinking, of self-identity that kind of go on and on and on. Now, the word karma in, in popular parlance is used as faith as well. So it's my karma to have beautiful blue eyes <laughs> or to have really ugly skin now or whatever, you know. So that that's the kind of popular misuse of the word, I would, I would think, right? And, and it's used in all kinds of ways. But if you, if you think of it more as intentional action, and that creates results. So if I have, and intentional means intentional. It doesn't mean that you're fully conscious of it, but it's still intention. So if I've tended to complain uh, at the age of 12, <laughs> Maybe I, I just like at the age of 12, I just picked up the habit of complaining. And then I did it a bit more at the age of 13. I got really good at it at the age of 15. At the age of 20, I would just, there'd be no more space. Like just so full of furniture called complaining that it'd just be a habit. The weather's hot, it's too hot. The weather's raining, too much rain. No rain, no rain, not enough rain. <laughs> the, mind, the mind would just do that. And that's just, right? It's just intentional action. Heedless creates a tendency, creates another tendency, creates another tendency until it's so accumulated. And then we wake up. <laughs> and then we wake up to, whoa, look what's going on. And then we go, oh, wow, there's a lot of thinking or there's a lot of emotion. And we think, well, that's okay. I won't do that anymore. Good luck. So then you say, no, I won't worry anymore. I just, no, no, today, no worry. And blah, 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 you're offered to worry. Or I'll just be perfectly equanimous, having loving kindness for all beings at all times. Good luck. You're angry at the neighbor for the dog poo on your lawn or whatever it is. Right? So then you see, oh, it's not just like a choice I have now. It's what we call, they call anusaya or latent tendencies, which have been created through habitual um, uh, heedlessness, really. And so they start to come out uh, as objects. Now the task is to know this is an object, don't attach to it. The object of, of, of greed, hatred, and delusion, various ways through thought. Um, and this takes a lot of patience to notice this kind of arising of, of a resentment or, or, or jealousy or anger. And these are habits. They're not, they're not who you are. But they're what stream of consciousness has been conditioned to do in circumstance in circumstances over time. And then the the refuge is in witnessing or awareness that ah, this is a habit. It arises and ceases. And this is why we, we emphasize the idea of anatta, that this habit of jealousy or this tendency towards cynicism or or self-disparagement or self-doubt, it's not who you are. That is not your real home. It's just the way consciousness is a condition, karmic habits, or vipaka kamma, resultant kamma. And so it takes a tremendous amount of um, fortitude and, 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 and it takes, first of all, right understanding to understand that this thought of jealousy is neither right nor wrong. To follow it would be harmful, because that would be intentional activity. But just to know it as it is, as Gabrielle said, it all belongs. Jealousy belongs. Not to you're not approving or disapproving, and the, the capacity to do that is called right understanding. You know, jealousy is an object. It arises because it causes, stays for a while, ceases. That's called right understanding. And you can see from right understanding there can be right thought. Don't make it a problem. It's just jealousy. Hi, jealousy. Haven't seen you for a while or whatever. Where well, you want to play with language? Uh, it's not the language of oh, I shouldn't be jealous. It's terrible. That's taking it personally. And then, and then one puts other things into the mind. Yeah, I don't like them, but may they be free from suffering and other kinds of uh, right attitudes. And then the, comp the, the, the negative egotistical habits begin to be undermined through the habits of goodness. You know, like, like 
meditation can be a very good habit, can't it? Generosity can be a very good habit. It's not a heedless habit. It's just something I do all the time, meditate or whatever. And then, then the mind begins to have a, 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 a balance where we can go beyond good comma and bad comma. Go beyond good and bad and get, and get to the silence of the mind, which is neither, which is not really karmic in that way. It's not something that's created through causes and conditions. And, and so we emphasize good lifestyle, uh, uh, generosity, morality, all those things. And that, like for me as a monk all these years, the result is really, really beautiful because I've, I've not exploited anyone, hurt anyone, not intentionally. Sometimes I've said things which are not nice and so on. I've just sort of lost the plot. But there's no heavy, heavy come up in that way, in, in that way. And there's a lot of, of joy and peace from, from the, the, the life being lived in a way which is very wholesome. But then the silence of the mind, that's something that's always there. You know, it's not that's dependent on, on, on causes and conditions. And that's where we can we can touch that the more or, or, or we process the, the kind of negative habits and, and develop very wholesome habits. So do good, refrain from doing harm, purify the mind, realize Nibbana. That's the sort of model that we have. All right. Laura, do you have a question? Yes, so Lampo, you can take one more question. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Laura, Laura, please unmute yourself. Okay, there you go. Hi, Laura. Yes, hi. It's very nice to see you again. I wanted to um, say two things. One, congratulate you and, and your fellow monks on getting Simon. Uh, you are in for the most amazing experience of complete unconditional love. Okay, I think you, we're all expecting that. <laughs> yes, yes. You will and, become the, the center of his life and he will become the center of yours and it will be an amazing experience. We thought so he'd do the Zoom session next time with you. <laughs> Sorry? We thought he could do the Zoom session next time with you. He probably would. <laughs> It'd be a different thing, but he it probably would. would. And it would be very lovely and, and full of amazing <laughs> love. That's there. what they give you. Okay. And the second thing, Laura? The second thing is I wanted to, to uh, speak to Gabriela. And, and I wanted to share with her how um, it, it really is um, important to me and significant to differentiate between accepting and approving. I have been struggling with accepting one of my son's choices. They wouldn't have been mine, but I have spent the better part of the past, of the last year learning to accept, learning to separate myself from his choices, learning to let go of that identifying link between him and I what I want for him as my son and what he needs for himself as an independent being from me. And it's been very difficult to let go. And it's very difficult to accept that that you don't necessarily would have chosen for them. And I think it's really, really important what you say about accepting is not approving. It's not being in agreement, but it is loving and supporting despite not agreeing, if that makes any sense. And I find that when I am able to remove the judgment and be accepting, I can then be compassionate and I don't put myself in his situation, but I can understand a different perspective. 
So I, I want to thank you for differentiating acceptance from approval. And I want to tell you, I understand, and it's not easy, but it can be done. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Okay, Vita, shall we close? Yes, Paul. Shall we? Do you have the loving kindness chant? Yes. Uh, before we go there, long um, on behalf of everyone, I have a rope here. Uh, virtually. Well, just take it through the screen. <laughs> um, I want to take this opportunity to make an invitation to the Noble Sangha community in Tisarena. As you embark on the rains retreat in a couple of days after the Sala Puja, may you please accept all our well wishes as well as our thoughts, our kind thoughts towards you during this three months. Uh, may all the meta and, and the good merits that will accrue through our practice be dedicated to your well-being, to the well-being of all the Sangha in Tisarena. May you all have a joyous practice and come out of this even stronger than before and continue to have the great compassion towards all of us that we may all receive here at the end of the Vasa. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. And pray for Amr Siri. Yes, and also we take the opportunity as we chant the, the uh, words of loving kindness. We dedicate this to Venera Amar Siri, yes, uh, to, to, to his speedy recovery, as well as to the welcoming of Simon into the family of <laughs> No, this world's going to know this thing. <laughs> Where have we got that? Um, there we go. <clears throat> This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways. Peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease, let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection this is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Uh -huh. Sama Sambuddha Bhagavad
Buddha Bhagavantam Aviva Devi Swagata Bhagavata Dhamma Dhamma Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sarawaka Sango Sanga Namani All right, everyone. Nice to be with you. See you next time. Thank you, Lung Paul. Take care. Thank you. See you. Come and visit Amr Siri and Simon. Bye-bye. <laughs>